All right, so welcome. Today we're switching topics and doing digital electronics. Um, like I said in the email, most people find this topic conceptually easier, especially uh, if you've done any of these kind of logic puzzles, or uh, I think some of you, uh, CS5, covered some of this. Um, but what I'm going to talk about today isn't so much the kind of high level mathy logic key side of digital logic, but the electrical side. And uh, I'll let you rely on your background information or your ability to puzzle out the various digital circuits. Uh, but I'll, I'll just focus on the electrical stuff. So, you know, most, most of you have gathered through your some point in your life that uh, digital circuits involve zeros and ones. Um, and a lot of people describe that as off and on. And the very first thing that I want to convince you is that thinking about digital logic as off and on, a switch that is open or closed, current that is flowing or not flowing, these are all possible ways of doing things. And, and maybe the very first computers uh, built using relays use some of these principles, but that is not how digital circuits work today. So uh, digital circuits don't work by encoding the one and zero in a flow of electrons versus no flow of electrons. They encode it as a high voltage versus a low voltage. And you know, as, as I've been emphasizing from the, from the beginning of the course, thinking about currents flowing is, is usually pretty easy, but it's not currents that we make or measure, it's voltages that we make and we measure. And so our circuits are gonna, are gonna focus on making and measuring the, the voltages. So, so this is this is bad. I'll draw an example of a bad circuit. So this is maybe coming in. You might have thought that if you had a block of logic and you wanted to input a zero or a one to it, you might have had some power supply. And usually here we use five volts for our logic and a switch. And you would either open or close the switch to give uh, five volts or not five volts into the logic. And this this is not what we do. This is not right. This does not work. In fact, when the switch is open, the, the logic, uh, the input that we're giving this logic is, is undefined. It's called floating. Uh, so, so this is a little bit better. Let me draw a circuit that's a little bit better. So uh, logic. So what we actually do is we have our input. And if, if we have a a switch available that can either go to plus five or switch over to go to ground. This is this would be ideal. And I think you have some of these these switches here. They have um, two th three wires coming off and and two positions. So you can switch back and forth between the two positions. Um, another way of doing this. That, that works okay is to have your logic logic and input a signal that is a switch that's connected up to five volts. So, so say, say you have a button rather than a, a two position switch. So if you have a button and you can press to make this contact, you can connect this up to plus five and connect this down to ground with a 10 kilo ohm resistor. This works. So then you, you press the button in and it connects this logic up to five volts, or it makes a slightly weaker connection down to ground through this 10K resistor. Um, but we actually do, so often we'll arrange things the other way. Sorry, there's a street sweeper going by. Often you'll put your 10 kilo ohm resistor on top and you'll put your button on the bottom and connect it to ground. Now this is a little bit confusing because when you push the button, it actually connects the circuit to, to ground, to a logical zero. When you're not pressing the button, it connects the circuit to logic one up to five volts to this 10K resistor. Um, the reason we do this is partly 
historical and partly for safety and partly for noise reduction. So what, what's bad about this is this whole button here, all the metal in the button is sitting up at five volts. Whereas here, all the metal of the button is sitting down at ground or it will be connected to ground as soon as you push the button. So this is a little bit better. Usually your connections to ground are, are better than your connections to five volts. Um, and historically, I'll, I'll show at the very end some, some, uh, some logic called TTL logic, transistor transistor logic. Um, historically, this worked a lot better for, for transistor transistor logic. You needed a strong low resistance connection to ground and you wanted to make a zero, but you could have a weak high resistance connection up to five volts if you wanted to make a one. So in the old days, this was kind of required. Nowadays, it's more just some combination of convention and connecting things to ground rather than having a button whose metal is, is floating up near five volts. So, um, so when you start making uh, circuits, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll need to have inputs, either switches or buttons. And this is a pretty good way of doing it. The other advantage of this is usually it's OK to connect things to ground. Ground is typically safe. Here, with, with what I say better, um, you have a very low resistance connection up to, up to five volts when you flip the switch up, up high. And so if something fishy is going on in here, you could provide, you know, you're basically connecting whatever is in here up to this power supply. And that, that might be worse often than connecting whatever is going on here to ground. So, so this is sort of the, the default setup that we'll often have. Although again, unfortunately, you have to remember that pushing the button gives you a zero, letting go of the button gives you a one. Uh, but you'll, you'll build some of these and play with them. Um, before I move on, let me point out um, this different kind of probe. So what's the difference between this circuit here where you're making a strong connection to five volts and a strong connection to ground versus this circuit here where you're connecting something to five volts or you're not connecting it to anything. So imagine if we just got rid of this logic here and we just measured this with a meter. We just measured, measured here with a voltmeter between there and, and ground. Well, a voltmeter, when the switch is open, it will measure zero volts. Whereas if we're measuring this with a voltmeter, um, so it'll also measure zero volts. When, when the switch is, uh, let, me, let me actually draw it like this. When the switch is in the down position, this will also measure zero volts, but these are different. This is zero volts because there's just no, no current flowing. There's just no, no path to, to, uh, to give these charges any potential. This is zero volts because there's a strong connection to ground when, when the switch is in the down position. And those are very different. This first situation is called floating. And that's kind of its own state in digital logic. It's a, a third state. And often, especially today, we want to avoid that state. We either want a strong connection to plus five or a strong connection to ground. So if you just have a voltmeter or an oscilloscope and you're measuring things, how do you tell the difference between a floating and a strong connection to ground? Um, it's, you, you can't really do it with an oscilloscope and a meter. This is why we have this whole separate device here. It comes in, comes in this package. Let me switch cameras for a second. Uh, let me switch, switch cameras for a second. So uh, this is called a logic logic probe. Uh, if you can read that, and uh, when you take it out, it looks like this. Uh, there are these alligator clips here, and these just clip to to ground and to your power supply, usually five volts, and then this thing has a, a pretty sharp point on the end that you use, you can probe around. And usually you probe around um, on the pins of, of chips or on wires that you're interested in knowing the state. And this thing has a couple, a couple of lights on it. It's really hard to see with the lighting here. There we go. It has a couple of lights on it. Uh, it says high, low. And so clearly this, these two lights are meant to, uh, to tell you whether you've got a strong connection up to high or a strong connection down to low. If you just wave it around in the air, neither the high nor the low light will light because you're not, you're not putting a logical one or a logical zero on the, on the tip. Um, and there's some switches here. Um, well, th there's a third light that, that you can 
uh, used to capture very short pulses, which we're not going to really do anything about that today, but next time we'll, we'll do some short pulses. Um, if the pulse is so short, you, you might not notice it, but uh, this, this light can, can light up for you know, half a second or something, and, and you can actually tell that there was a pulse, even if it was short. And then there's a switch on here that says, okay, do I want it just to pulse or do I want it to actually stay on when, when I get a short pulse? So there's one option. And then the other option is a switch called TTL versus CMOS. And I already said that the old style of logic is TTL and that it was asymmetric in some way. And the new style of logic, which I'm going to talk mostly about starting now, is called CMOS. And that, that is symmetric. So the border between what we call zero and what we call one happens at halfway from zero to five, happens at two and a half volts for CMOS. Uh, the border for TTL is, is somewhat lower. Um, and for CMOS, uh, this logic is going to output something. And CMOS outputs a really strong zero or a really strong five volts, whereas TTL is a little bit more mushy. It doesn't quite go all the way down to zero. It doesn't quite go all the way up to five volts. Um, but by switching the switch between the types of logic you're using, it, this sort of better senses the whether future logic of that same type will think it's a zero or think it's a one. So mostly we'll keep this on the CMOS setting and, uh, and probe around. Um, it also is also beep, which is a little bit annoying. So you can cover it with a piece of tape and it will beep slightly less loudly. Uh, it might not be as annoying to you as it would be for your housemates or if you're actually in the electronics lab and you've got 10 of these things beeping, it can get a little bit annoying for everyone else. All right, so I'm gonna switch back to the other camera. Uh, okay, so let me talk about the, the actual logic circuits here. So this is how, how we make zeros and ones with buttons and switches and resistors. And now I want to talk about how to do computations with those zeros and ones, how to do basic, uh, basic logic. So while I'm erasing, does anyone have any questions about any of this? I'd say the biggest, uh, biggest thing that people get wrong is measuring zero volts with a voltmeter or just looking at it and realizing that, okay, there's not connected, it's going to be zero volts, but you're actually putting in some intermediate weird floating thing. And I'll show you why that's bad in a second. Okay. Can go by? okay. So we're going to introduce a new kind of transistor today. And we could have introduced this transistor earlier and we could have used this transistor in analog circuits, but uh, we, we didn't. This transistor can be used for analog circuits, but it tends to be used first and foremost for digital circuits. And the general type of transistor is called MOS, metal oxide semiconductor. And I'll explain why there's metal, there's silicon dioxide, which is basically glass, and semiconductor is silicon. And there's, there's going to be two types. There's going to be NMOS and PMOS. Uh, let me put PMOS on top. It always goes on top. PMOS and NMOS. I'm going to start off with the NMOS because it's most like the, the transistors we've used so far. So uh, let me draw what's, what's inside of an NMOS transistor. And, and I didn't do this for the bipolar junction transistors because it wasn't quite as, as simple to explain what was going on. But uh, I'll just sort of sketch out. So, so you have a hunk of silicon and you dope the silicon with some atoms uh, like boron that have fewer electrons than silicon, fewer valence electrons. So boron has three valence electrons, silicon and carbon have four valence electrons. So you're doping the bulk of this with something like boron. And so since there are fewer electrons, there's actually missing, missing spots in the lattice. And those missing spots are called holes. And so this is called p-type because the, the, as, the, as the missing spots move around, it's as if these holes are moving around and it's as if positive charges are moving around. So we call this p-type. Um, within this bulk material on the surface, we do a couple of things. We, we make some regions of N-doped material. So this is, um, 
silicon that's been doped with something like phosphorus, which has an extra valence electron. And so there's an extra, extra electron available to float around the lattice. So it's N for, for negative charges. Um, and then what we do is we attach metal directly to here and to here. And oftentimes to here, although we don't usually worry about this one. Um, in fact, we'll usually connect. And most of our circuits will end up connecting these together. Um, and then, oh, OK, so this is going to be called the uh, source and the drain. It's like we had an emitter and a collector. There's a source and a drain. Source is going to be a source of these uh, car charge carriers. A drain is going to be a drain for these charge carriers. Um, and finally, we need a gate. We need something to control it. So it's not called a base. This is called a gate for these types of transistors. And what we do here is we actually have a piece of glass, a silicon dioxide, that covers this region here. So that's glass. So no, no charges can go through the insulating glass. And then we have another piece of metal, which is the gate. And so what's nice about these transistors is that you put a voltage on this gate, but no current ever flows in or out of the gate, except briefly when you're kind of charging, you know, charging this piece of metal like a capacitor. In steady state, there's no current that flows. Unlike, unlike the other transistor, we have to worry about current coming in on the control channel. Here, because you have this insulator, there's, there's no current. OK, so let's imagine you put in a bunch of positive charges here on the gate. So a bunch of positive charges on the gate here, positive, positive charges on the gate. What that's going to do is it's going to attract negative charges um, in this p-doped material. So a bunch of negative charges are going to come up to the edge here. It's going to push away. It's going to push away the holes. So there's some holes floating around. It's going to push away the holes and leave a, a channel for electrons to flow. And, and now what you're going to do is you're going to apply voltage between the source and the drain to make these electrons flow up. So to make electrons flow up, that means you make the drain be at a positive voltage and make the source be at a negative voltage or a lower voltage. And then electrons will flow up or a regular current will flow down. And if you were to get rid of these positive charges on the gate, there would be no channel for electrons to flow. And, and just silicon by itself is, is a semiconductor. So it doesn't, it doesn't conduct without doing something to it. So it's, it's uh, basically a very good insulator until you put charges on this gate. And then it becomes a conductor between these two, these two channels. All right, so how do, we, how do we use this in a circuit? Well, let me draw the symbol for this. Uh, so the symbol for this looks, looks like this. So this is the drain up here. This is the source down here. And the gate, we draw like this. And this connection back here is called the body. And sometimes we draw it, sometimes we don't. Uh, if you draw the body, it looks like that. This is the source, so source of electrons. Of of electrons and a drain of electrons. Um, and how we use this in a circuit? Well, let's let's connect this up to a resistor. Goes up to plus five volts. Make it a 10k resistor. Basically, all the resistors are going to be 10k today. Uh, this is out, and this is in or gate. Connect that to ground. Okay, so. So current wants to flow down, or electrons want to flow up. But unless you do something with this gate, unless you put a positive voltage on this gate, no current can flow down. So it's, this acts like a switch that's open, acts like it's not there. And out is a, uh, makes a connection up to, to plus 5. Let's make a little table here. So for, uh, so for NMOS, if the gate uh, the gate is, uh, well, hold, don't, let me do it this way. So the gate can, can either be at zero volts 
or five volts. And um, let's do, so this will all be for, for NMOS and we'll do all, all the same thing for PMOS in a second. So what is out here? Uh, well, let me say, so NMOS acts like a switch when, when there's zero volts on the gate, it acts like a switch that's open. When there's five volts on the gate, it allows current to flow through. So it acts like a switch that's closed. And what is the output here? Well, the switch is open, so there's no connection down here. Out has a weak connection up to plus five, plus five volts. And when the switch is closed, out has a strong connection down to zero volts. And yes, some current flows, but usually we don't worry about that. It, but we will, we will today in a little bit. All right, so, so we put in, so if, if I were to say uh, in, in terms of uh, logic, the logic in, this is a zero, this is a one, and logic out, we have a one and a zero. So what have we made here? We put in a zero, we get a one, we put in a one, we make it, we've made a zero. What we've made is we've made an inverter. And so this, this circuit is what's called an NMOS inverter. This is an NMOS transistor. All right, um, let's do the same thing, but with, with PMOS. So let me draw uh, the, the PMOS transistor. I'm gonna switch, switch colors to a different color to kind of distinguish the two situations here. So for a PMOS transistor, everything is flipped. So it's sort of the inverse here. There's N-doped silicon, there's P, there's P, um, there's an insulator still, but there's a, let me draw a gate that's sort of slightly off. It's still called the gate, and this metal is still connected here. Um, here, the source is going to be on the top, and it's actually a source of positive charges that are going to flow down. So most of what's in here are negative charges floating around, but when we put negative charges on this gate, it'll attract these positive charges and allow them to flow down. So the source, source of positive charges drain the positive charges. Um, what this means is we need to make the gate go lower than or equal to the rest of this. So when we use a PMOS transistor, we put it on top. So let me draw the circuit here with the PMOS transistor. So here, PMOS transistor is going to be on top. And if I were to draw this spotty connection here, uh, it looks like that. And there's two, two ways to tell the difference between these. One is the, this arrow here is different. That has to do with the, the diode characteristics. But the most important one, so oftentimes we don't even bother drawing this. The other one is the direction that the gate comes off. So for PMOS, the gate comes off on top. Just in the symbol, and that's how we can tell the difference. And then we'll have our output here and our ubiquitous 10K resistor down there. And now let's, let's do this whole table again for PMOS. So this acts, acts like what? Well, if you put, uh, if you put zero volts on the gate, that means that this whole thing here is at five volts and you put zero volts. So you're putting negative charges on the gate and it allows current to flow down. And so unlike an NMOS, this acts like a closed switch. And when you put five volts on the gate, this acts like an open switch. It doesn't allow charges to go. Um, output is gonna be the, uh, well, you might think it would be the opposite of this, but you have to be careful here. So it acts oppositely, but it's also in an opposite position here. So when the switch is closed, 
meaning there is a strong connection. Your out has a strong connection up to plus five volts. And when the switch is open, there's no, there's no, no connection here. There's a very high resistance. And so the switch has a slightly weaker connection through this 10K to ground, zero volts. And so logic out is, is the same. And this, this circuit here is called a, a PMOS inverter. PMOS inverter. Um, and, and this works pretty well, but there's a disadvantage, which is that when this switch is turned on, there is some current that's flowing down through this resistor. And if you want to build a processor out of this, you need thousands or millions, or in the case of modern processors, billions of these transistors, billions of these circuits. And you've always had these 10K resistors, billions of little leaking charges would end up making a huge amount of power that, that you don't want and don't need. And so there's a, a trick to combine an NMOS and a PMOS transistor in the same circuit. And that's, that's what's going to give us our, uh, what we call a CMOS circuit, a complementary metal oxide semiconductor circuit. So CMOS is not a type of transistor. It's a way of arranging NMOS and PMOS transistors in a, in a complementary way, as we'll see, so that uh, we don't need resistors and only one is on or one is off. So let me draw that over here. So this little, what I want to draw is called a CMOS inverter. And there's always going to be plus five. And there's going to be two transistors, one PMOS, one NMOS, and ground. And we'll take the power from here, or take the output from here. So the NMOS has its leg coming out the bottom. PMOS has its leg coming out the top. We're actually going to connect these together to the input. Uh, input. And I'm not going to draw the, the, the body connections. So, so we can go through this whole analysis here, and you'll see that basically the same, same thing happens. So let me just do uh, this is for CMOS. CMOS out and logic out. Okay, so, so when, when we have a logic zero in, that means the gate is zero volts, and one of these is going to open and one of them is going to close. So NMOS here on the bottom is going to open, and PMOS on the top is going to close, and so our out is going to be a strong connection to plus 5 volts and a logic 1. And in the opposite configuration, uh, the NMOS is going to close and the PMOS is going to open. And we're going to have 0 volts, strong connection to 0 volts, and a logic 0. So there's two advantages. One is that the, uh, the, the connections to 0 and 5 volts are strong. right? They're not going through some wimpy 10K resistor. Or a real solid, you know, ten, tens of ohms connection to ground or tens of ohms connection up to plus five volts. Uh, so that's good. And as long as the input isn't moving around, either this one is on or that one is on. And so there's no current that flows down. In fact, if you design the circuit poorly, then you might get a short and a lot of current would flow down. But because it's complementary, Either you have some connection up to plus five or you have some connection down to ground, never, never both. And so there's no current here in steady state. And so you can get extremely low power logic this way. The only power that has to happen is when you switch the input from one thing to another, these, these are capacitors here because there is some uh, conductor and a tiny little bit of conductor here with an insulator in between. You have to charge and discharge the capacitors. And those charges have to go somewhere. So there's a small amount of current, but it only happens when you switch. So this is the sort of the beauty of, of modern, uh, modern digital logic, modern processors using CMOS technology. Um, let, me, let me pause and ask questions. I'm going to keep the CMOS inverter up, but I'm going to erase the NMOS and PMOS circuits. Uh, but you can ask questions while, while, uh, while I'm erasing. Keep the table up for a little bit. 
we've, we've made an inverter three different ways. And, and the CMOS way is the sort of preferred way. And if you buy uh, an inverter chip, CMOS inverter chip, it's going to be made like, like this. So one of the things you'll do in lab is use chips that are already made. They have logic, logic functions built like this. And then another thing you're going to do is make, make these things yourself and explore some of the, the properties of just the bare transistors, because they are a new kind of transistor, although they're much easier to think about than the old kind. All right, so I'm going to do two things. One, one is to make a whole table of, uh, of all the logic gates we care about. And maybe you've seen this somewhere before. Uh, okay, so let's say these are all two input gates. So you have two inputs, A and B. And our first gate is going to be an AND gate. And it's going to look like this. So A and B both come into an AND gate. And AND gates have a straight back and a curvy circle front. And then the output comes out. And what's great about digital logic is unlike analog, we have to sort of deal with equations, here you just sort of brute force it. You just consider all possible inputs and what happens in all possible situations. So I'll just do the logic. It could be logic zero, logic one, one zero, or one one. Those are all possible combinations of A and B. And an AND gate is defined as giving you a one only when both A and B are high and giving you a zero otherwise. And there's an OR gate which has two inputs and it looks like this. It has sort of a swoopy back and a pointy front. An OR gate goes high when either A or B or both are one, otherwise it's zero. Um, there's something called an XOR gate, an exclusive OR gate, which has an extra swoopy back and a pointy front. And it's it goes high when either A or B, but not both, are one. That's the table for XOR. Um, and then there are two other gates, which are actually uh, more interesting in some sense, because one, I'm going to show you the circuit for one of them. And two, they're universal. So with a NAND gate, you can make any of these other gates. And what is, what is a NAND gate? Well, it's an AND gate. Logically, it's an AND gate followed by an inverter. And rather than draw an AND gate and a triangle with a little circle, uh, the circle always means logical inversion. So even without the triangle, it, it inverts it. And so this is just the opposite of the AND. So this is 1, 1, 1, 0. And the other universal gate is a NOR gate, which is just not the not of an OR gate. So an OR gate with an inverter. Okay. And if I look at the table for or, I can invert it and get one, zero, zero, zero. That's my table for an or. Okay. So, you know, you can puzzle through why either of these gates individually. So if I just gave you a whole pile of NAND gates, you can make any other gate out of them, including the inverter. So if you just tie the inputs together, and you're only really considering the case where A and B are both zero or both one. And the NAND inverts that. So if your input is zero and you tie them together, then your output's going to be one. If your input is one and you tie them together, your output's going to be zero. So you can make an inverter out of this. Um, and once you have an inverter, you can invert this to get an AND. And uh, I'm not going to show you how to make all the other gates, but uh, it turns out if you invert the inputs here, you can get an OR. And, and Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. You can sort of build up all the gates and all combinations of gates from just the whole pile of these NAND gates. So it's interesting mathematically and computer science because it's a universal gate, but it's also the one I'm going to show you the circuit for. So uh, let me do that. Um, let's see. I will. I will get rid of this, but I will keep the part of the table that says how these things act. I'll draw the circuit over here. So remember, this was PMOS. PMOS acts like that or like that. 
Okay, so let me, let me get this other color here. All right, so let me draw the circuit. So this is a CMOS, CMOS NAND. So I'll draw the circuit and, and we'll work through the logic in a second. Uh, okay, so here's plus five. So if we want, let me just draw the output. So here's our output comes here. If we want the uh, output to be plus one, if A and B are zero or A is zero or B is zero. So anytime one of these is zero, we wanna make a strong connection up to plus five. And so remember the PMOS chips, when, when their gates are zero here, so this is the input, input. When, when the gate is at zero volts, PMOS acts like a closed switch. So PMOS will connect, connect it up to plus five. So we want to put uh, two PMOS transistors up here. I'll do that in, in, in parallel. I'll do that here and another one. And we'll connect our output to there. So here's our input A and input B. We want those connections. Uh, but we want to make a strong connection to ground when both of these are high. So when both of these are high, um, the NMOS transistor acts like a closed switch. And so if we put NMOS transistors in series, and NMOS has, has the gates coming off down the bottom, input A, input B, um, then when both of these inputs are high, it will make a strong connection to, to ground. And so this is complementary in the sense that there's NMOS on, on the bottom and PMOS on the top. And uh, depending on the configuration of A and B, you only ever have a strong connection up or a strong connection down. And you never have any current that can flow straight down. It's never the case that there's a path from here down to the bottom. Uh, but this is very important to, well, this is why it's very important never to float these inputs because you want your inputs to either definitely be five volts or definitely be zero volts. You don't want your inputs to be kind of wishy-washy somewhere in between where these switches are kind of halfway on, halfway off. Uh, because if all these switches are kind of halfway on, halfway off, suddenly there can be a lot of current that flows, that flows down. And so what you want is you want your, your inputs to be definitely zero or five. And if they transition, you want them to transition really fast. You don't want to spend a lot of time in the in-between transition region uh, because then there's, there's never a lot of current that can flow straight down and, and, uh, and uh, power be wasted. And, and once they're all the way high or all the way low, uh, then, then no power is actually being wasted in this gate. You know, the, it is performing this logical operation, which is a universal logical operation. Uh, without dissipating any power. So that's kind of cool. Um, I will say one, one more thing. Let me, let, yeah, let me pause for, for questions here. So that this is PMOS stuff up here and NMOS. NMOS stuff down here. Um, let, me, let me pause for questions. I'm going to erase the CMOS inverter. So while I Take questions here. You should ask questions, otherwise this erasing is very boring. Oh, all right, all very obvious to everyone. Yes, I'd say the digital logic stuff tends to be simpler to think about. It tends to be a little bit annoying to build, especially with the buttons and the everything else. Um, let me draw the old style logic. So I'll, I'll draw an old style, uh, this is old, old TTL, uh, I think this is a NAND. And, okay, so how does this work? So what's nice is that it involves components that you're used to. The, the types of transistors you've seen and resistors and diodes. Um, I'm gonna do this kind of, quickly and schematically. I'm not going to label what the value of the resistors are, but uh, 
So here your two inputs actually go through diodes in the backwards direction. So there's A and there's B. You see that? Yeah, barely. Okay. Um, and and this line here goes into the input of a transistor, uh, a regular PN transistor that you know from before. And there's a resistor up on top and a resistor on the bottom connected to ground. And each of these goes into a transistor. Uh, and there's a diode in between. I'm going to leave myself much room here. And a resistor up on top. This one, I'll actually write that's 120 ohms. Okay, and where's the output? The output is down here. So you can see one, this is much more complicated. Uh, two, there's a lot going on. And three, let's imagine how, just look at this output here. How, how low can the output get? Well, the lowest it can get, it can't go all the way to zero volts because there's always, um, there's always this transistor here. And remember that the, the smallest, the, the, when this transistor valve is open as much as possible, the smallest voltage difference between the collector and the emitter is still a few tenths of a volt. And so uh, we'll say something, you know, something like uh, th this output goes from about maybe 0.2 volts, maybe 0.3 volts up to how high can it go? Well, there's a diode here. So it, if this is five volts, there has to be something going through this resistor and then this, you know, about 0.2 from the here and at least a diode drop. And so this ends up being, it can only go up to about 4.2 volts. So for the old TTL style, the outputs never get all the way down to zero and they never get all the way up to, to plus five. And if you look at the inputs here, that they are also asymmetric, right? So when the inputs are high, um, no current goes through this diode. And so it's like they might as well not even be there. So by default, the inputs are basically connected up to plus five with this resistor. And it's only when you pull the inputs low, when you attach the inputs to ground, either one or the other, uh, that, that anything changes. This is one of the reasons why back in the beginning, when we were to set up our switches, we often have the switch make a strong connection to ground. And we don't care if the switch makes a weak connection up to plus five because in this old style, um, the circuit was basically weakly connected up to plus five through a resistor anyway. So this has several disadvantages, but uh, uh, you know these these chips continue to linger. And what's even weirder is sometimes you get CMOS circuits that purposely imbalance themselves to act nicely with the TTL. So here the threshold voltage between being considered an in input that's one or zero is around half of the supply voltage. So it's around two and a half. Here, the threshold where the output changes is much lower. It's closer to a volt or a volt and a half. And so sometimes you actually get CMOS circuits that, uh, that are sort of purposely imbalanced to act like these old TTL circuits. So you have to be a little bit careful and, and you'll, play with, you'll play with some of these today. But I would say that if you're designing something completely new from scratch and it doesn't have to hook to anything else, um, you, you would go with uh, CMOS circuits because you could always connect CMOS up to, to uh, the TTL. So having a CMOS, an output that's perfectly zero and perfectly one, that's great. This old TTL chip can handle that without a problem. Uh, the issue is going the other way around. So this output here, you know, ideally, this 0.2 volts kind of works to turn these transistors on and off and 4.2 volts kind of works to turn them on or off, but it's not great. Uh, if, you, if you hook a TTL input to a CMOS chip, um, these transistors aren't really all the way on or all the way off. And so they don't really act as ideally as, as if you only connect CMOS stuff to, to itself. So you have to be a little bit careful. Uh, but uh, you, you'll play with this a little bit in the lab. All right, so that's, that's all I have for today. Uh, the only 
the only comment I have is that your buttons, if, if you chose not to use a button for your uh, integrator two, two labs ago, I guess, um, you, you will need to use the buttons today and you need to figure out the buttons actually have four wires that come off and you have to figure out which two wires get connected together when I push the button. And the other problem with the buttons is the wires that come off aren't really perfectly straight. And so you have, you have wire, uh, wire strippers that have pliers. And so I want you to take the, the kind of weird, oddly bent wire that comes out of the buttons and squeeze it with the pliers to make it straight and point straight down. And then you can put it into your breadboard and just put it into your breadboard somewhere, you know, somewhere unrelated to everything else uh, across a trough. So you have access to all four, all four inputs. And then just measure with an ohmmeter um, pushing the button and seeing which, which ones are connected when you push the button, disconnected when you don't push the button. And somehow make a note of that for the future. So because you'll, you'll be building things with buttons uh, from, from now on and it's, you, you don't want to have to test the buttons every time. So straighten the legs of the buttons with the, with the pliers and, uh, and make sure you know which, which pair gets connected together when you push it. All right? Questions?